Okay, great. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers and thank you for being here. So today I'll talk about stochastic geometry to generalize modern process machine learning. So this is joint work with uh, Eliza, who you would hear, uh, she'll come in about an hour. Okay. Um, so this is Pete Mondrian, uh, the Dutch painter who later, you know, moved to New York and was very known for his style of this primary kind of uh, composition with boxes and colors. Okay, um, this this figure here was not created by Mondrian the painter, but uh, was created by a computer using the Mondrian process. So what's the Mondrian process? So it was proposed in machine learning by Royan Tay, 2014. It's a stochastic process that produces a recursive partition of space using random axis aligned cuts. Okay, so um, there are lots of STIT experts in the audience who would recognize that this is a special case of flexible iterated tessellation. I'll talk about them in a bit. But if you have never seen, oh, can people hear me okay? I'm sorry. I, I was told that my internet's unstable. Um, if you have never seen the Mondrian process before, it's fairly easy to describe. So in one dimension, you start with an interval, 0, 1. Um, and then you have a Poisson point process running in time this way, right? Where you think of it as Poisson rain. So you have this rain or snowflakes, you know, falling down at, you know, basically exponential times, right? So if, if you're looking at the ground here at zero, 0, 1, then what the process looks like is you wait for an exponential time. When the clock rings, then you draw a point uniformly at random on the line. Right now, that's your first snowflake, and it uh, subdivides the interval into two halves. Right, and then for each interval, you run a separate independent exponential clock. You know, with the rate is you know proportional to the length of the interval. When the first clock that rings, right, then uh, you choose a point uniformly at random on the line, and then that's your second snowflake. And now you have three intervals, and you repeat again with three independent exponential clocks. Right, so in two D. Um, Right, so before I talk about the 2D, so one of the main motivation of Ryan Tay is that this process here uh, was very much studied by uh, people doing uh, uh, sort of phylogenetics, right? So for example, people doing Kingman coalescence or fragmentation of masses, um, then this process came natural and it was, was well known, uh, I think in the 70s and 80s. Right? So one of the question is how to generalize this process in higher dimensions. And so Roy and Tay led to this, uh, from that view, they, they led to this generalization, which is in 2D, right? Say you start with a box, then you should just run the Poisson rain process, but on the edges of the box, right? So again, you wait for an exponential time. When the time comes, uh, you draw an axis, uh, a line cut, right? Um, uh, intersecting a point here uniformly at random. Then now you have two squares and then you repeat, right? And generally, here's a picture of Mondrian in R, R3, where you can play the same game by running the Poisson rain process in 1D on the edges of this box. Okay. Any questions on the Mondrian process specifically? Okay. We're good. All right. So, uh, yes, there are lots of STIT experts in the audience. It's a bit, you know, nervous to talk about this. So, uh, so, the Mondrian process, that exact process with the name Mondrian, appeared in the machine learning literature 2014. Okay, um, but unknown to them, you know, this was of course already generalized by stochastic geometry uh, ten years before, right? So a stable iterative tessellation was proposed by uh, Nigel and Weiss in 2003 as a model for uh, formation of cracks. Uh, in, in the plane or in RD, right? So it is a stationary random tessellation of RD. And um, here the cuts are drawn from a distribution lambda uh, over possible hyperplanes, right? So every hyperplane can be specified by its normal vector, right? Which is V, which is the normal in the unit sphere, right? And you also, um, it's specified by normal vector and its distance from the origin, right? So this distance is a constant C, right? 
So to get a random hyperplane, what you can do is if you have a measure on the sphere, on the unit sphere, then you pick a, a point according to this uh, distribution. So you get a random vector. Um, and then with your normal vector, uh, you look at uh, uh, the line and you can generate, say, a Poisson point process on this line. At each point at each your process, then you get a hyperplane. You know, uh, with this normal vector v and cutting cutting this uh, uh, this line at this point. Okay, so yeah, please go ahead. Was there a question? Okay, so compared to the Mondrian process, right? Then the slit process is more general because it allows for uh, just general uh, cut directions, general hyperplane. Whereas the Mondrian is the special case where you drawing only from one of the uh, after the line uh, uh, normal vectors, right? So the Mondrian, you're looking at the normal vectors can only be in the set, you know, E1, E2, da da da, up to ED, where these are the, uh, you know, the, the standard coordinates, okay? Okay, so here's a picture. Here's a sort of picture of the STIT process with Mondrian colors, right? Um, so these pictures were produced by James Murphy, who uh, was in Austin, and project thinking, okay, um, I really like the fragment, and I wanted to um, generalize the fragmentation process to the state, right? So here you here you get a normal state. Right, and here this is a stit with a parameter uh, alpha, right, where it has the property that uh, cells that are small have a higher um, have a higher probability of getting the quality that uh, some once they get small below a certain point, then they just quickly dis disintegrate into dust. So you get a, a slightly different behavior, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, we could prove things, but it will show to us how to connect gene learning, and that that is the main theme of my talk today, right? So stochastic geometers know a lot about stable iterated relations. Right? Uh, there are many, you know, ver, you know, many papers over the last ten years, uh, and so the key question is. Can stochastic geometry be used to answer questions stemming from machine learning about the Mondrian process and its generalization? So uh, yeah, so I'll give you three examples of what we did in the paper and then some open questions. Okay. So here is why machine learning people are interested in that. the initial uh, one of the very first use is uh, the idea of a modern. Um, so generally, if you have a partition of space uh, into boxes or into cells, then you have a right, which is um, um, uh, right, which, which is a you think of it as a function that inputs a point and output. Um, so every cell, you can think of every cell as having a uh, representing a category, could be a dot, right? If I classify an image, then I could represent an image as a point in RD. Let's say in this case, R2. So let's say here I have two cats, two dogs, and something else. And I want to say, given a new point, uh, uh, given a new image, uh, is it a cat, a dog, or something else? If I have a petition of space, and this doesn't tell me how can I, uh, uh, is it a cat or a dog or something else, right? Namely, it's just, it, it's just uh, telling me which box am I falling in, right? So in this example, if point x1, x2, right? So if x1 is bigger than seven, then it means it lies on this left side. Uh, if it's not, if it's not bigger than zero seven, then it lies on the side of this line. And so uh, uh, it falls into the same box uh, as these uh, red points here, right? And 
Otherwise, it falls onto the right side. And then I go ahead and check, is it bigger? Is X blue 0 0.5? If it's not, then it falls into this green box. And if it's blue, it falls into the other box. Right. So given a partition, partition of application machine learning. Now, if you have uh, the monitoring process or the STIT process, then you have a way to get a random partition of space. And with it, you get random truth. Right. So this is, you get random trees. Okay. Now, random trees, uh, having randomness uh, for, if you have real data, uh, having randomness is better, right, uh, than having uh, a fixed position. Okay. For distribution, right? So that given your data, uh, it could perhaps output like the best tree that would fit your data. So if you don't know what the data looks like in advance, you want to pick a tree that uh, fit with this data. Okay. Now, a random tree was a was very popular around this time, right? Uh, I think basically before 2016, they were very popular. After that time, they usually they've been overtaken by. Uh, you know, a deep neural networks and the likes for the for the very kind of trees, um, but it's very difficult to prove that they are good, right? They, they're good empirically on data. Um, people find the analysis very difficult, right? But the Mondrian trees have the advantage. Um, the modern tree have the advantage that it is self-similar and it, it has a very easy construction, right? So easy construction. And so with the modern tree, it is possible to minimize rates, like the kind of results that are uh, very popular in statistical learning. So statistical learning with modern tree is easier. Right? So that's one big motivation for, for doing the, the the Mondrian trees. The second is that, uh, and this is very interesting here, um, in this paper by Brian Tay, they really care about uh, computing these trees efficiently, right? And with the Mondrian trees, what you can do instead of partitioning the space first and then look at your data points, then you can first locally partition the space around your data points. And when new data points come in, you can extend your partition. So of course, in general, this is true for STIT as well, right? Because uh, you know, STIT is a you know you can ex it, it has a, a consistency property, right? And but but other ways of constructing random trees do not necessarily have this property, and so therefore, for uh, Mondrian process, um, this efficiency was very important in in, uh, in in making it popular with machine learning. Okay. So we could generalize this to a stable iterated, uh, you know, replace the Mondrian tree by stit trees. So these are um, basically, you know, trees with cuts drawn from the from a general hyperplane measure. And uh, machine learning people looked at this quite early, right? So I met I, I met Tay in 2014, and I told him of the stit process, and we look at this exact problem. You know, the question is. How do you simulate this in practice? At that point, we thought it was a bit difficult because if you had general cut directions, then, and if you want to do this online uh, algorithm, that is, if you locally look at a neighborhood and now you want to extend the partition uh, outside of this neighborhood, it seems a bit more difficult uh, if you're dealing with uh, you know, other sorts of cut directions that are not just axis aligned. Right? So we ran into computational issues. And then, so our first result with, with Eliza recently is that at least for the case where you have STIT with finitely many cut directions, um, you can simulate them as you take a Mondrian uh, process in a higher dimensions, and then you intersect it with a uh, subspace, right? Okay, so here's a, here's a formal statement, right? If I have uh, normal directions, U1 up to UN, um, these are points on the unit sphere. Uh, so I can uh, I can line them up, you know, as rows of my matrix U, right? Um, and uh, if if I have a stit tessellation uh, with these normal directions, right, and with the with the uniform measure over these directions, right, then uh, this guy has the same uh, distribution, 
right, as the intersection of a Mondrian process uh, uh, in Rn with uh, an appropriately constructed subspace L. Right? So this is particularly good if I have many directions. Right? If n is large, but d is small, right, then I can uh, uh, basically uh, you know, generate and also uh, analyze uh, this kind of uh, process. So for machine learning, I should say, as a result in stochastic geometry, this is not difficult. But for machine learning, this is very important because it tells you that you can efficiently um, uh, generate these process. Right? Uh, so, so efficiency is, is very important. Right? Okay. I'll pause here. So Okay, so, so here's an open question for you. Something that we definitely don't know the answer to this and we hope some experts will, will help us with, which is if I have a given data set, right? If I have my cat and dog in some very high dimension, right? So I have cats here and dogs here and maybe some other sorts of pictures here, right? Okay, uh, my goal, oh, oops, sorry. There's a bunch of things in the chat. Oh, you're losing the speaker. Okay. Uh. It has improved. Oh, it has improved. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Improved. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, at the beginning, it was a bit difficult, but now it's. it's... What was difficult? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Right, so here, here's an open question, right? So for a given data set, say if I have a bunch of, you know, label points in very high dimension, um, and I want to construct um, this, you know, I want to construct this uh, uh, random uh, trees, right, to get my classifications, right? Then perhaps I don't really want to, uh, I can, hopefully I can get fewer cuts by choosing a better, a better cut direction, uh, uh, that is by, by choosing a, a more general stick. As compared to uh, just doing an axis aligned cut like a Mondrian, right? So the question is for a given data set, what would be the optimal set of cut directions I could choose, right? Can I compute this? And can I show that it works well in practice? Uh, that is, it is efficient to do this in practice. And also, hopefully, I can show it in theory as well, right? So, I mean, it's, it's easy to cook up of like, you know, examples where it's, it's clear that if you have, uh, you know, um, like if you can, for example, start with a stit, right, and then um, and then uh, generate points uh, where um, you know you can simulate where, where points in the same cell of the stit are given the same label, right? Then obviously in this case, the the most efficient thing to do is to use uh, is to rediscover the stit lambda that that you use to generate this process, right? Any other measures to cut up, cut up this space will often Often end up having to make many, many small cuts at the boundary in order to, you know, um, properly distinguish between these points, right? Uh, but the question is, of course, we don't know what this true lambda should be. So uh, hopefully, there, there's some way to discover this just from by just by looking at the data. All right. Uh, so the other part. Uh, the second example is what's called the Mondrian kernel. Okay, so the second example concerns the Mondrian kernel. So this was in the work uh, also by the Royante group, uh, 2016. So the idea of a uh, kernel method, in general, the idea of a kernel method is the following. Uh, Let's say for this example, I want to compute something like this, right? I want to compute for points x and x prime in RD. Let me say I want to compute this function here. So it eats x and x prime. It spits out e to the minus lambda times the L1 distance between uh, x and x prime. Okay. So here, this is the you know, this is the L1 unit ball. All points you know on this diamond are equally have the same distance from the origin, right? Uh, have the same L1 distance from the origin. Right? So, uh, well, I mean, if D is small, 
then this is easy to compute, right? So D small, this is easy, right? If D is large, and this is often the case in machine learning, so D is large, think about D as like 10 to the nine or something, right? So then it's very time consuming, right? And like you have lots of points, lots of points, right? Then it's very, very time consuming to like even store these points and then compute all these pairwise distances, right? Then this like takes forever, right? Time consuming. So the idea of a kernel method is that instead of working directly with X, you work with a transformation of X, right? So you want a function phi, right? That eats X and maps it to a much smaller space, like uh, uh, M, right? Where you want M to be much smaller than D, right? Okay, um, and, and, and then you would try to approximate the uh, kernel K by using phi, right? So the hope is that under this map, then I'm going to have a K prime that's going to eat two X and X prime, and it's going to spit out just the inner product between phi of X and phi of X prime, okay? So my goal is to find a phi such that M is much smaller than D and that K, and that K prime is very close to K. K, K, uh, K is my target kernel, right? So that's the general idea of the kernel method. So you can, so the point of this paper is that you can use the Mondrian process to construct such a kernel. The kernel is very easy, right? The kernel is just um, this binary vector here that comes out of your decision tree where the ith coordinate is the ith node or the ith cut in your Mondrian process, right? So ith uh, coordinate corresponds to the i cut of your Mondrian process, right? Um, and it's going to be one if you lie on the right side of the cut and it will be zero if you lie on the left side of the cut, right? So the effect when you take the inner product between uh, phi x and phi x prime, then you get this indicator that is one if x and x prime lies in the same partition cell and it's zero otherwise. Right? So that alone is a poor approximation of any kernel, right? But now the key point is you run, right, M independent Mondrians, and then you take the average. Right? So you take the average, um, so your kernel phi is constructed as you take uh, M independent Mondrian. For each Mondrian, you run into a certain time lambda, and that gives you a certain partition of space. Then for each Mondrian, you get one of these uh, phi vector, and then you average uh, over all such phi's. And so now each x is going to get uh, more or less a vector of real numbers representing it. And now in this case, the, um, the paper proof, uh, it's not too hard to, to see, right, that um, if this m goes to infinity, then uh, the kernel that you get uh, from this uh, phi m is converges to your target kernel here, right? So this is called the Laplace kernel. All right, so now the advantage of the Mondrian construction is that um, you can control the precision just by running the Mondrian a little bit longer, right? Because the effect of that is you just extend, uh, as you have more cuts, then you just extend your phi vector to more coordinates, right? And so, um, and, and it's, it's very easy to parallelize this process. So it gets, again, the main gain is in speed. Right. And this is a this is a very very important issue in machine learning, so that you can easily compute uh, this phi function uh, using stable iterated tessellations. Okay. Any questions on the kernels? Okay. So uh, so then again, our question is, what do we gain when we go from the Mondrian to general states? Right. So theorem two of our paper. Uh, Characterizes all kernels that can be approximated by uh, uh, by you know certain types of state tessellations. Okay, uh, so here are some examples of kernels. So instead of going getting Laplace, you can get like a you know a, like a, a, a rotationally invariant one. Uh, you can get uh, some ellipsoid looking things. You can get like zonotopes. You know, um, uh, right. So that's uh, what we don't know is to characterize 
are station, non-stationary kernels that a state could approximate, right? Um, so it seems that we're hoping perhaps, you know, using some Cox process or something that you could get a, uh, you, you can uh, push the boundary further and get a, a wider choice of kernels, right? So all the kernels here, so remember a kernel is, uh, is, a, is a thing that eats a pair of points. Uh, and then maps out, you know, some uh, uh, R plus, right? Um, and, uh, and, and these, are, I, I'm, what, what I'm drawing here are the set of points with equal distance uh, from the origin, right? Okay, like the kind of like the unit ball of uh, different unit balls of, of the kernel, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, so in machine learning, so so if I have a stationary kernel, right? Then uh, I'm just saying that okay, actually k basically functions like a map from R d to R plus, uh, where if it eats two points x and x prime, then all that matters is just you know the vector x minus x prime. Right. So this is a little bit limiting in machine learning. You would like to have non-stationary kernels as well, and uh, but you would also want to keep all the good features of uh, of a Mondrian kernel. Namely, you want uh, the self-consistency uh, and and uh, and so so that it translates to uh, to to speed in computations. Okay. So yeah, so that so we have a third result, uh, which is a Mondrian estimation. So since I'm out of time, I won't uh, say too much about that. Uh, but it it's one. This is you can think about this as an application of you know a Mondrian kernel. Um, so it's very common if you have a kernel. Uh, it, it's a standard to to have a kernel density estimation. Um, and if you have a Mondrian kernel, then you have a Mondrian estimation, right? And then what we showed is that um, what we don't know is the convergence rates of the Mondrian kernel, uh, uh, of the Mondrian density. But what we do manage to show is that if you use the Mondrian for density estimation, uh, then we sort of explicitly get the kernel out, right? So we know a fair bit about density estimation. It's just some questions in statistical learning that are still open, right? Okay, so in summary, um, Mondrian process arise in machine learning. Um, it's a special case of SID, and we very much hope that there will be more development at the intersection of uh, stochastic geometry and machine learning. Yeah. Thank you.